you please remain standing for the reading of God's Word? Our text this morning is our continuation in the Gospel of Luke, and it begins in verse 67. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, I hope, church, you've had a, a good week and uh, that even coming now to God's word and worship is refreshing your soul. We had, we had a bit of a week ourselves as the Wajniki family um, on Tuesday. Uh, we drove up to Fresno. Some of you might be saying, why would you drive to Fresno? Great question. No. The, um, some dear friends of ours, their daughter was getting married up there. And, and you're like, why are they getting married on a Tuesday? Well, they work at a Christian camp. And so everybody that was a part of the wedding, uh, they all work on the weekend. So the only time they could get married was in the middle of the week. And so it was a sweet time to go there and to be with them at, at the wedding. But what was so crazy for me was that my oldest daughter was one of the bridesmaids. And I know know that you're, I'm getting old when I look up there and I'm like, you're not old enough to be a bridesmaid. Your friend's not old enough to get married. How is this all happening? And so I told her 10 more years and uh, then you can know. Um, so it was, a, it was a sweet, sweet time. But then um, in the midst of our week, you know, I appreciate Pastor Paul's prayers and, you know, everybody is going through different things. Um, on Friday, I put my wife Hannah on a, on a plane because I was just done with it. No, because... Um, her cousin, his wife, um, she was 45, uh, last week passed away of a heart attack unexpectedly. And so Hannah um, went back to Chicago and met her sisters and they're driving down and the service is going to be tomorrow. And, and, um, and so, you know, just, you know, there's some other unexpected people who passed away this week and, you know, just any given week, you don't know what is, is going to transpire, what's going to happen. There's joys and there's sorrows. Um, and it's in light of all of those things, I'm so grateful that we have a heavenly father who has actually chosen in his great kindness to give us his word. Now, we don't have to go through life wondering and guessing at what our God is like and, and what he desires for us, even in moments of joy and in moments of sadness, because he has chosen to speak to us through his word. What a great privilege that is. And so we're going to do that. We're going to look again at the word. And so I invite you to open up to the gospel of Luke. We're in, we're in chapter one of Luke's gospel. And Luke's gospel is like the other three gospels where in its totality, these gospels are the record of the life of Jesus and each one of them coming at the life of Jesus to emphasize different things. And when you look at Luke's gospel, it's a little bit different than the others in where it starts. Because up to this point in Luke's gospel, we have not even yet encountered Jesus. We're, we're about 80 verses in as we come to the end of, of chapter 1, and, and Jesus isn't even born yet. And you'd be thinking, look, if Luke's gospel is about the life of Jesus Christ, then, then why are we actually starting with a story about a man named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth? And that's because what Luke is doing for us, and especially in our text today, is he's, is he's setting the life of Jesus in its context that there were things that needed to happen, things that needed to transpire in fulfillment of what God had said would happen before Jesus would come. And so why does Luke's gospel start with the story of Zechariah and an angel appearing to Zechariah and telling him that he's going to have a son, he and his wife, although they're old and beyond childbearing years? It's because of who that son is, that that son is going to be the, the promised prophet who would come before the Messiah who would come before the Savior. 
And so what we've been reading, what we've been studying in particular in this text, is we've been looking at the birth of this boy who would be named John. And so that's the section that we're in. Um, John is coming now and being born. Nine months previous, the angel had come to Zechariah and said, hey, you're going to have this, this baby boy. And when Zechariah heard that message, we know that he didn't believe it at first. He's like, do you know my wife? Have you seen her? How old she is? Like, she can't have a baby. And so God said, well, you're going to be mute. As a sign to you that I can do these things, you're going to be mute, unable to speak until your child is born. And so now here we are, nine months later, where the story picks up in verse 57. And in verse 57, it says, now the time for Elizabeth to give birth. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. And so John is born. That's what the first part of the story is about, the birth of, of John. And, and she gives birth to a son and the crowds ask her who are gathered there, what are you going to name the boy? And they were expecting her to say Zechariah because that's the tradition. You name the firstborn boy after the father. But she says, no, his name shall be John. And his name needs to be John because that's what God says his name's supposed to be. But when they hear her say that, they don't believe her. And so they like, they ask her husband. Now, Zechariah can't speak. So he asks for a tablet and he writes out the name the text says. And he says, his name is John. And the moment that they call him John, God performs a miracle. He gives Zechariah back, back his voice. And Zechariah begins to speak. And he begins to praise God. And the people in that moment, the text tells us, they all wondered what this could all mean. Who is this child going to be? What's the meaning of this moment? And so what we saw last week was the beginning of this song of praise that Zechariah sings, where he comes and he speaks not just to the people in that day, but, but even us today to say, what's the significance of my son's coming? What does it mean for the world and, and what is it all leading to? And so we're going to pick up today where we left off. We're going to actually take a step back and, and review this, this prayer that Zechariah, or this song of praise that Zechariah praises because he says, listen, if you want to understand Jesus, you have to understand what is taking place in the here and now. And so, so let's pick it up in verse 67. I'm going to read the first part of it. Zechariah comes and it says this. Zechariah says, blessed be the Lord the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who, what? Hate us. Zechariah says, you want to know who my son is going to be and what's the significance of all that's happening? Zechariah comes and he says, what you're witnessing, what, what I'm witnessing in this moment is the fulfillment of promises that God has made to his people. In fact, Zechariah doesn't come and say that there are promises yet to be fulfilled. Notice how Zechariah speaks in this passage. Everything that he says is in the past tense, which is so strange because his son John was just born. And Zechariah knows that his son John is to be the, the forerunner, the one who's supposed to go before the, the Messiah to announce his coming. And he's a baby boy, so he hasn't done any of this yet. In fact, Jesus Christ, the one who is the Messiah, he hasn't even been born yet. And yet, yet when Zechariah speaks church, he speaks in such a way that the things that God had promised, they've been fulfilled. And, and he's not mistaken in this because Church, Zechariah is showing us something very, very significant, which is this. When you see God's plan beginning to unfold, when God begins something, we looked at some scriptures last week, can anything stop the plans of God? What's the answer to that? Let's try that one more time. When, when God starts his plans, can anything thwart the plans of God? No. And so Zechariah says, listen, John's born. The plan is in action. Everything is as good as done. And what is as good as done? What is it that is taking place? Well, the meaning of this moment, first and foremost, we see in the text is that through Jesus Christ, the Davidic covenant has been fulfilled. The very first thing that he wants us to know about the significance of John's birth and the coming of the Messiah is that it means that the Davidic covenant has been fulfilled. Now, last week we talked about why is this significant? Well, who is David? What's, what's the Davidic covenant all about? Well, a covenant is a binding promise. 
And, da- and God made these binding promises throughout the Old Testament with different individuals. And each one of these binding promises was pointing forward to something that God would do in the future. And one of these binding promises that he made was with David, who was one of the kings of Israel. And the significance of the promise that he made to David was this. David was one of the kings of Israel. And the kings of Israel were supposed to represent the people or to represent God to the people and God's reign over, over them. But the kings would continually fail because they were sinners. They, they, they lacked the power. They lacked the righteousness that was needed to rule as God would want them to. And so what did God do? He came to David and he said, all the way back to Adam, I promised that I would send a redeemer, a rescuer, someone who would crush the head of the serpent, one who would conquer sin. And so David, here's my binding promise to you. It's through your line, through your offspring, that I will establish a king on the earth. And this king will rule over all. He will be the Prince of Peace, mighty God, the everlasting father. This is who the king will be that comes from your line. He will conquer the foes of my people and he will rule not just over my people, but he will rule over all the earth. You see, the beautiful thing about the promise of a Davidic king is if your king is on his throne and he's ruling and is reigning and you're underneath that king, that means that you're not under the reign and rule of another king. Now that might seem obvious, but think about it. For, for God to make a promise to David that one day he's going to send a king who's going to reign and rule over all, what the promise is this, listen, my king is going to be so powerful that no one can stop him. And if you are under his reign and his rule, that means you will have been set free. You are no longer under captivity to anyone else. And in fact, that's what Zechariah says. Look at, look at the promise here that's right there. It says in verse 69, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of the prophets, that we should be saved from our enemies. The Davidic king is the one who's going to rescue the people of God from their enemies. And at that time, the Jewish people thought that their enemies were the Romans. Their salvation in their mind was a geopolitical salvation to be freed from oppressive nations. And so great, when our king comes, he's going to conquer the Romans. But that's not what the Davidic king was all about. In fact, what we discover in this text and what he's trying to show to us is the redemption and the salvation that the Davidic king offers up to us is is salvation and redemption from captivity to sin. This is what the Davidic king would do. There's a day to come when the Davidic king will establish his reign and his rule over all people, but the focus of the king's coming was to free us from our enemy, and our enemy, the one who keeps us in bondage and captivity, It's not the Romans. It's not fill in the blank kingdom. It is our sin. That's the thing that the people of God must have a king who can rescue them from. And Zechariah says, Jesus Christ's coming means that those who are captives of sin can be set free from sin. That no longer will sin have power and dominion over the people of God if they are under the reign of Jesus Christ the king. And just to show you that that's exactly what the enemy was that Zechariah had in mind, drop down to verse 76. In verse 76, we read this when he's now talking to his son, John. He says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in what? The forgiveness of their sins. That's what verse 77 says. This is a salvation that the people of God need to be anticipating. The Romans are bad. The Assyrians are bad. The Chaldeans are bad. The Greeks, all of those people who oppressed you. Yeah, they're bad. But when Christ comes and he has, those who are captive to sin are set free because salvation is and forgiveness is granted. Church family, listen to me. The reason Zechariah praises the Lord and the reason our hearts need to be praised, need to lift up praise to God is this beautiful truth that if you are in Christ Jesus, you have been set free from sin's dominion over you. Praise the Lord, amen? This is our hope. This is our Joy. This is the thing that, that lightens the hearts of us who are saints because we get to say, listen, listen, yes, we still struggle 
with sin in our life. We wrestle against the flesh and the devil, but, but they do not have dominion over us. We're no longer captives to them. In fact, listen to me, church. Jesus understood this. Jesus wanted us to see him as this Davidic king and that our greatest enemy we've been set free from. Look at John 16, 33. In John 16, 33, Jesus speaking says, I have said these things to you that in, may, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Trials and struggles will still exist. Paul says in Ephesians, as we studied, that we, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, blood, but against the spiritual forces that are at work against us. But take heart, Jesus says, take heart, because I will one day overcome the world. Is that what he says? He says, take heart. I have overcome the world. I have. For you and for me, the king is on his throne. Jesus has conquered sin's stranglehold over you. Praise God for that. It's too often we, we look to the coming kingdom. Listen, God has established his kingdom and there's more to come. We looked at that in the book of Revelation. We saw that one day he's going to take away all pain, all suffering. Death will be no more. He will come down and everyone will see the fullness of his reign. Church, I look forward to that day. But don't just sit on your hands. Don't just be a people who cower and think there's still a glorious day to come. Today's a glorious day. Sin no longer has dominion over the people of God. You've been set free and you can live in this new life. And because Jesus says, take heart. I emphasize this and I'm reviewing this again today because church family, when you understand the words of Jesus, when you understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of this Davidic covenant, you begin to see that you and I can go out into the world, that in the Christian's heart today, there can be a certain boldness, a certain courage, and a certain fearlessness when we look at the things that are happening around us because we know that Christ is reigning, because we know in our heart and mind that neither height nor depth nor anything in all of creation can separate us from the love of God because our King reigns. Do you have that confidence in your heart? Do you have that boldness? When you are faced with anxiety, when you're faced with fear, we think about this truth, perfect love casts out fear. Nothing keeps you because your king has come and he's rescued and redeemed you and he's poured his love out upon you and me. And, and I look at this and I say to us, we can look at the things of the world and they can grieve us and we can be saddened by them, but church... You're no longer a slave to sin. You and I are a child of God. And if you want to look rightly at the world, when you see the things happening and the news will do its best to create fear and anxiety in your heart to say, yeah, but my king's on the throne and nothing that is happening here limits his power. And in fact, nothing that's happening here in this world will keep me separated from him in the eternity that I have. There is a present reality of Jesus Christ being your king that says, praise God, I can fight sin in my life. And there's this future reality that allows you to say, no matter what happens, let them do their worst to me because I have an eternity with my king. This has present day impact on us. I hope that you're living in it. I hope that you're living in it. That just alone, like I said, is enough to just say, praise the Lord, we should be done. And we could just leave here. But he goes on. And he says that there's more to come. And in fact, in these next verses, he's going to talk about another thing that, that God has fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And before we turn there, I want you to think about this. When Zechariah speaks these words, the people of God have been waiting hundreds of years. This Miss to David was made probably somewhere about six, eight hundred years before all of these things um, had taken place. And so there's been a long time that they've been waiting for the Davidic king. The next thing that he's going to say is fulfilled was thousands of years. Can you imagine waiting long, so long for a promise to be fulfilled and to know what it's going to look like? When I was um, four years old, my family was living in Chicago. That's where all the family's from. And, uh, and so we're living in Chicago and... My brothers and I 
one of the things we wanted desperately to do is we wanted to one day get to go to Disneyland in Southern California. It was, it was to us, you know, that, that far off distant magical land. And we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to go? Like in that time in my family's life, like I, we weren't even quite yet middle class. And so the idea of going to Disneyland was like, you know, this was gonna take some sacrifices. And so my dad came to us and he said, Dave, after he turns five, um, we'll take a trip to Disneyland. And we're like, can we get that in blood? Can we get that, you know, taken down, you know, kind of thing? And he says, after Dave turns five, we, we'll, we'll take a vacation to Disneyland. We need to save up and do these things. And so, um, you know, so the days go by, I turn five, and my birthday comes and my birthday goes. The next day I wake up, I'm like, all right, let's go, let's do this thing. You know, Dis- I'm five. And, uh, and it didn't happen. Another day goes by, you know, a week, week goes by. It's like, you, you, he promised that we would go to Disneyland, what? After I turned five, right? Words mean different things to kids than versus parents. And when you're five, a day's like a week, a week's like a month, right? And a month is like a year. I turned six, we still haven't gone to Disneyland. So it's been like 12 years now since then, right? <laughs> if you're, are you tracking with me? Like, that's how long it feels. My dad comes, though, and after I turn six, he says, all right, we got it on the schedule. We're, we're going to Disneyland. And we can't wait. We finally get to do it. We get on the plane. We come out to California, and it was just incredible. The, I'm smiling because I'm picturing some of the pictures that we have. I mean, we're these, we had our little Midwest accents even back then and stuff. You know, just, we were just blown away by what we got to experience. And not only did we get to go to Disneyland, but my dad's promise was we were going to go to Disneyland. We also got to go to Universal Studios. And we're like, this is, this is so awesome. In fact, when we got to Disneyland, as we were going through the gates, they were doing a, some kind of anniversary celebration and bells and alarms went off. My brother got a, got a ticket that allowed him to come back to Disneyland anytime in the future for, for free. And so, in fact, we eventually used that ticket 10 years later after we had moved to California. Not only did we get to experience Disneyland and Universal Studios, my dad kept his promise. He took us there. The hotel that we were staying at, check that. It was a motel that we were staying at. (laughs) Across the parking lot from us, we see these trailers and these lights and these cameras, and they were filming a TV show that was actually my brother Todd's favorite TV show at the time called The Fall Guy. We thought this is the, this is the land of dreams, right? You know, it's like Disneyland, you know, they're filming movies right next door. You know, this was, it was so exciting. I share that with you because in that time and in that space, for that year, I thought, is, is this ever going to happen? Is my dad ever going to fulfill this promise to me? It was only like one year. And did my dad fail to keep his promise? No, he didn't. He kept his promise. Not only did he keep his promise, but what we ended up experiencing was something far greater than what we had actually thought the promise would be. When we see Zechariah talking about the Davidic covenant being fulfilled and that it being that we're freed from captivity to sin, this, this is this idea that not only is God faithful to keep his promise, but it's greater than what you thought. And it's not just the Davidic covenant that he says God has come and fulfilled. The next thing that we see in the text is there's one more covenant that he's fulfilling. And look at it with me. It's, let's read down. It's in verse 72. I'm going to pick it up at verse 70. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father, who? Abraham. Now we go from this Davidic covenant being fulfilled to Zechariah saying, right now, the Abrahamic covenant is being fulfilled. God is fulfilling two of the promises with the coming of Jesus, and we are getting to reap the benefits of what those things are. Now, to understand what those benefits are, what the fulfillment of these covenants mean for us, we have to talk about Abraham for just a minute. Abraham was not always Abraham. First, he was Abram. He was just a regular guy. In fact, he wasn't even Jewish. You might say, wait a second, wait a second. He's the father of the Jews. Yeah, he, he, that eventually comes, though, because of the Abrahamic covenant. But if you want to know who Abraham was and why that covenant that, that God made with him was so important, you have to know where Abraham was from. I'm going to show you a map here. I've been enjoying maps. I don't know if you like I like them, so you're going to deal with them. So, so it helps us understand what takes place. The text tells us in Genesis chapter 11 that Abram 
and his father Terah were from Ur, the land of the Chaldeans. It's modern day kind of Iraq. And, and that's where he was from. So Abram was actually a Chaldean. And God called Terah and they went up to Haran or Haran, however you want to say it. And, and, and that's up there in the east, which is now modern day Syria. And it's while they were there that Genesis 12 comes and says that after Terah died, God speaks to Abraham, this Chaldean man. And here's what he says in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham. The Lord God said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I want you to leave, not just Ur of the Chaldeans, but I want you to leave there in the north. I want you to go, leave everything that you know and come to the place that I will show you. Now, when he's going to send them there, as we're going to see in just a minute, but before we see why he wants him to go there, I want you to understand something. How regular of a guy was Abraham? Like, was he special? Was he more holy than everybody else? In Joshua 24, two through three, we read that he was a worshiper of false gods. So this man that that God calls and God chooses. God calls and chooses because God chooses to do so. And he comes to him. Let's look at now at the rest of the text in Genesis chapter 12. Go from your country and go from your kindred and your father's house to land that I will show you. And I will make you of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So I'm calling you and choosing you that you would be a blessing. In what way? I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see, to understand what God is doing here, you gotta understand the bigger story of redemption, that you and I, all of humanity, created to live in the image of God, created to have relationship with him, but sin separates us from God. And the promise God made to Adam was as we were talking about earlier, was one day to, to re reunite humanity to himself. And the covenant that's being made with Abraham is this covenant that God is gonna do a work through Abraham's offspring in which humanity, which is separated from God, would one day be restored to him. That literally we could be God's people once again. And this is picked up again in Genesis 17. God comes and he restates this covenant to Abraham a number of times. And in Genesis 17, Starting in verse seven, he says, and I will establish my covenant between you, between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting promise. And I will be their God. The promised covenant to Abraham is that through you, I'm going to create a new people. Through you, I'm going to join myself back into relationship with humanity. The blessing that would come from the one that would come from Abraham would be this one to make a people of God, to take those who are far off from him and to bring, him back in, bring them back into relationship with him. At its very core, the Abrahamic covenant, it's not just about the Israelite people getting the land. It's about God making a people for himself. And, and this is exactly what we see and understand, church. The New Testament authors understanding the fulfillment of the work of Jesus Christ to be. You see, in verse 74, he goes on to say that, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him, that is God, without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. What will be the, re the result in the life of people for the Messiah to come, for the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled? That we would be able to serve God without fear and to do it in righteousness and holiness. And you and I might just read right past that without understanding the significance of what he's getting at here. Listen, God is holy and perfect. Like that's what the Bible proclaims. He is 
He is one who cannot have relationship with those who have sin. And the reason why it says that in the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled, we can now serve him without fear is be, not because we're worried that if we serve him, our enemies will see it and we'll get in trouble. No, it's that if you are unholy, if you are not righteous and you try and serve a holy and righteous God, you will be rejected. He will not welcome you in. In fact, Isaiah, the prophet of God, when he came into the temple in Isaiah 6 and, and he sees the Lord seated on the throne, he falls on his face and he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner and I'm surrounded by sinners. And he's like, I feel like I'm being undone in the presence of a holy God. And so what we see being said here is that, listen, if the Messiah comes and he's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, then those who are unrighteous and holy, now through this Messiah, they become holy and righteous. They become sons and daughters of God because Christ gives to us his holiness and his righteousness. To be the redeemed is to be those who've not only been set free from the captivity of sin, but to be given the position and the identity as those who are holy and righteous. This is what it means for the Abrahamic covenant to be fulfilled. It's not just that you're no longer a slave to sin. It's that your very core identity has changed. That's what Zechariah says. This is what it means. For the Messiah to come, you who were unrighteous and defiled sinners, the Messiah changes you. He makes you God's people. To be God's people means at your very core you have been changed. I like to say it this way. When you think about the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant, for the Davidic covenant to be fulfilled means that your situation has changed. Your situation has changed. For the Abrahamic covenant to be filled, it means that your identity has changed. Your identity has changed. You go from being cast off to actually be kidding, being called a child of God. And like I said, that's what the New Testament authors believed and proclaimed. When you come to the book of Galatians, in fact, if you have a Bible, I want you just to turn there so you can see this with me. The apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, he's reflecting upon Christ and his work in comparison to, to the Jews who believed that they were saved through works of the law. And listen, if you believe that you can be saved through works of the law, Paul is coming and saying that's an impossibility. There's no one who can do good deeds enough in order for the holy God to accept him. You have to have somebody from the outside come and give you a new identity and so look at what he says here when you come to, to, Gen to Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 10. He says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. It's trust in another, not trust in yourself. Trust in Christ he goes on to say, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He died on the cross to deal with our sins. Verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, look at this, the blessing of who? Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The promise to Abraham was that God would make through him a people, that he would bring forth one who would unite people back to God. And so now we become, as Zechariah has already said, we become righteous. We become holy. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done. Church, this is the good news. Do you know that because the Davidic covenant is fulfilled, your identity is radically changed and altered forever? Forever. When you look at yourself, you've heard me say this. I've been hitting this a lot ever since we've been in the book of Ephesians. These two truths are found all over the scriptures and are found at the beginning of the life of Jesus. If you want to understand what Jesus does for you, he sets you free from sin's dominion over you and he changes your identity from a sinner to a saint. And that's not something to come in the future. That's something for the people of God 
today, in this place. And if you want to know why this is so important, let me tell you, if you are not reflecting upon or embracing your identity, there are some, there are some really, I think, some tragic things that can happen in your life as somebody who proclaims to be a follower of Jesus. Number one, it's far more easy to excuse sin in your life. Far more easy to excuse sin in your life if you are embracing your identity as a sinner and not as a saint. See, if you don't see yourself as righteous and holy before God the Father, then you're gonna make excuses for the things that you and I do on a day-to-day -day basis that aren't a reflection of righteousness and holiness. Because if you're not righteous and holy, then why would you expect to display anything other than things that are unrighteous and unholy. But God's word comes to you and says, throw that idea aside because the Savior has come, Zechariah says. You and I get to now serve God in present day righteousness and holiness. In fact, the other thing that can happen to you and to me is that we become contented with the status quo. If we're not understanding that we are holy and righteous, then we're not interested in wanting to grow into conformity to the righteousness and holiness that we now possess. We're content to just simply live the way that we've already lived rather than examining our actions and saying, is that a fruit of righteousness? Is that a fruit of holiness in my life? You are righteous and holy. But if you're not reflecting and remembering who you are, you won't be looking to, to grow. That's why I almost start all my message. Are you ready to learn? Are you ready to grow? Because as someone who is righteous and holy, been set free from sin, I can't be contented with the status quo. And one of the things I find is that for some Christians who don't embrace the fact that they are now children of God, that they are righteous and holy, what happens is you begin to think that I have to do good things. I have to go to church, read my Bible, not swear, not get angry, not cut people off while I'm driving, you know, that I gotta, I gotta do these things in order for God to love and to accept me because you're trusting in your righteousness. That's exhausting. Just look at your child's face when you give them a list of to-dos, right? When you give your, say, hey, can, I need you to do this today. They're like, oh gosh. Like, even if there's a benefit at the end of the day, you know, I've done this with my girls growing up, say, hey, we're going to get all these things done and then we're going to get to go have a treat. And, and it's like, still, they're exhausted. If you view God as like dangling a treat for you, if you do these good things, you're exhausted. Rather say, no, I am righteous. I am holy. I don't, I don't live this way as a way to make God love and accept me. It's because I've been transformed by him. You know, there's a, there's a story of something that happened recently in sports. And I'm from Chicago, so I'm going to tell the story. Because what happened, I think, was really helps us in a, in a very practical way see the importance of knowing your identity. Um, like I said, I'm from Chicago. And so my favorite baseball team is the Chicago Cubs. I'm sorry, it just is. You know, you're just, it's, it's injected into you as a child. I don't know. Love the Cubs. In 2016, the Chicago Cubs made the World Series. That in and of itself brought tears to my eyes. We're going to the World Series. You know why that was so significant? Because the last time that the Cubs had actually won a World Series was 108 years ago, okay? Like a century since they had won a World Series. And so we thought, maybe this is the year. The problem with the Chicago Cubs, though, if you know their history, is that it, they hadn't won for 108 years. And anytime they got close to the World Series, they lost. And so people thought that they had a curse on them. Yet this World Series appeared to be different. The Cubs got the lead. They're playing the Cleveland Indians. And they were leading the series. Eventually, though, the Indians tied the series. And so it went to a game seven. If you were a Cubs fan on that day, you know, you were just like, oh, no, not again, not again. We're going to lose. We were up in the series and we're going to lose again. And as the game was going on, for those of you that remember, and most of you are like, I didn't give a care. I'm like, hey, hey, watch yourself. The Cubs were winning and dominating the game. As it came to the end of the game, they were winning six to three. Eventually, though, the Cleveland Indians tied the game. And we were just like, not again, not again. The momentum shifted. I mean, all right. So I didn't tell this the first hour. I got a little bit more time. So I'll just tell you, we were, we were at my parents' house. 
okay? And, and it was getting late. I was letting the girls stay up and we were watching the, watching the game and there was a rain delay. And so I'm like, we need to get the youngest one home. So we, so we ran home, we're listening to the game in, in the car and, the rain, and a rain delay happens. And they're going into the 10th inning and when the rain delay happened, you could just tell that the Cubs were totally dejected. But then something happened in the clubhouse. One of the veteran players for the Cubs, a man by the Jason Hayward, he did something. He saw that everybody was downcast. And you could, he said, you could tell. People were thinking, here goes the curse again. This is who we are. We're just, we lose the big game. But the thing about the Cubs that year was that they had the best record in all of Major League Baseball. And he pulled everybody together. He said, hey, hey, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Everybody, you know, he's just like, he said, remember who we are. We were the team with the best record record in baseball. We're tied right now. There's no curse. We are the best team in baseball. Our record proves it. And for those that were there in the clubhouse, they said when he said that, something just clicked in their brains. The, the, the game had been going down, 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 down. And then all of a sudden when they said that, he's like, yeah, we're not losers. We have more wins than any team, including the team that they're playing. There's no reason why we can't win. And much to the great joy of every Chicago fan, <laughs> they went out and they won the game. And they won the, this is the picture, you know? They won the World Series. Tears of joy in the Wojnicki family to, to see that happen. They won the game. But what Jason Hayward did was he showed us a fundamentally important truth how important is to remember who you are? What is it that you're focusing on? Did he speak the truth? They were the team with the best record in baseball. You can't argue with that. Church family, who are we? We are the holy and righteous ones of God because of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. Are. That is our identity today. And Zechariah says, if you're going to understand anything about Jesus Christ, you need to know that when he came to this earth, he set you free from sin's power over you. And he gave you this new identity as the people of God. That's who we are. It changes how we think. It's incumbent upon us to come back like Jason Hayward did with the Cubs and said, do you know this is who you are? This is what the Messiah has done for us. Church, I want nothing better than for all of us, including my own heart, to live in this truth. It's transformative. And what, what Zechariah does here then at the end of this song, I'm gonna go through this really quick, is he turns his attention from Jesus as the fulfillment of this great promise to then speaking about the very specific role that his son has. And so what we see at the end here is he comes, he says, now that you know, this is what the Messiah will do and has done for you. Let me tell you, son, the role that you have. And I like to picture that maybe he was holding John when he said this. But what he says to John is found in verse 76. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Just as the angel had said, John, this will be your role. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. Why is God doing this? Why is he fulfilling his, his promises? Why is he giving sinners and making them saints? Why is he freeing captives from sin? Because of his mercy. And what's gonna be the result of this? Whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's right here in Zechariah's song that he says, you wanna know your role, John? Here's your role, to make the good news of Jesus Christ's coming known. This is what you will do. You'll make his coming known. People will get to hear about the fulfillment of these things because you'll be the one who begins it. We're the ones today who carry on this message. We're the ones who go to the ends of the earth and make these things known because, because we have experienced that truth for ourselves. But I want you to see just what he focuses on what Zechariah considers the good news. And there's two things. First, he says, here's what the good news is about Jesus' coming. Salvation through the forgiveness of sins. Salvation through the forgiveness of sins. 
tying it back to being freed from captivity, he says very explicitly, listen, he fulfills the Davidic covenant. You and I experience salvation through the forgiveness of sins. So how are you gonna get the forgiveness of sins? It's only through the Messiah. The second thing that he tells us, and this is in this beautiful poetry here at the very end, is that you and I experience favor and peace instead of wrath. This is the good news. Salvation through the forgiveness of sin and favor and peace instead of wrath. Do you see how he says that with the coming of the Messiah, then there's these beautiful words. It says, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. Instead of darkness, light will be shining upon us. Instead of the cold, damp night of air, the light of the morning will rise to warm us and it will give us light so that death is but a shadow. He's quoting Psalm 23 here and he will guide our feet into peace. So when the Messiah comes, he will establish for you and for me favor and peace with God instead of the wrath that we deserve. And he says, John, this will be your role to make this good news known. Listen, we haven't even heard Jesus say a word yet in Luke's gospel. Yet before he comes, before he begins his ministry, God through Luke lays out for us as clear as day who we should understand Jesus to be at his birth, during his life, through his death, and from his resurrection. He is the one who fulfills the promises God has made. And so today we can say, praise be to God. His promises have been fulfilled and they are far better than what anyone could have imagined. Let's pray together. Lord, as your word comes to us this morning, it comes with great truth and great clarity. I just am so grateful that my heart and mind don't have to wonder about what is still to come, but instead can rejoice and find great fullness and joy today because of what has come, what Christ has fulfilled, that you have shown us in and through your word that captivity from sin, that's no longer our condition. It's no longer our situation. That those who are sinners, it's not how you see us, but Christ makes us holy and righteous so we get to serve him. We get to serve you all of our days knowing that we have your love, we have your acceptance because of the new identity you've granted to us. Lord, if there are any in this room this morning who aren't walking in that truth, who don't know of the identity that they have in and through Christ, but instead only know guilt and shame, may they hear your words and know that to turn to Christ is the only way by which we can be saved that only through faith in him, Lord, that lives can be transformed. For those of us who have heard these truths this morning, I pray that we would go forward walking in them. Lord, your word is so good. Let us not be contented with our sin. Let us not excuse our sin. Let us not strive to, to earn your love and acceptance, but instead bathe in the work that Christ has already done. Thank you, Jesus, that you have overcome the world. And so let us as your people now take heart. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.